Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Susan Tanner, Vice Chair, Group of 78, and Chair of the Organizing Committee. And today, on Wednesday, September 29th, the program is Building Resilience in the Global Climate Emergency. And we acknowledge that we're zooming from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin Ashnabe First Nation territory and commend the federal government for establishing September 30th as Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Day. We begin today with His Excellency Bob Ray, Ambassador and Permanent Re Representative to the United Nations, who will speak for about 20 minutes, and Roy Culpepper, Chair, Group of 78, will be moderating the questions after the Ambassador's keynote. After a very short break, we will continue then at one o'clock with the presentation on Communities for the Future, Municipal Leadership, Donut Economics, and Adapting to a ch Changing Climate. Yes, there is a fortunate link because the Donut Economic Theory places the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in the center of their model, representing a focus on the basic human needs of all the world's people. Now to introduce our, his, um, our speaker, His Excellency. I have followed with great admiration the career of our eminent keynote speaker from brilliant, idealistic young lawyer to now an experienced and respected elder, elder statesman. I refer you to his impressive bio in the program, but in summary, he has been Premier of Ontario, Interim Leader of the Federal Liberal Party, Negotiator of the Matawa Tribal Council of Northern Ontario for them, Canadian, Canada's Special Envoy to Myanmar, and Special Envoy on Humanitarian and Refugee Issues. He continues to serve as Senior Fellow at Massey College and the Raoul Wallenberg Centre for Human Rights. His recent report on humanitarian and refugee issues, published just before he was appointed ambassador, is entitled, A Global Pandemic Requires a Global Response. This clearly leads into the title of his remarks today on why climate adaptation is such a critical issue. Thank you, Ambassador, for addressing us today. Well, uh, thank you very much, Susan. It's uh, it's great to be with you, and great to be with you all. I'm I'm very very appreciative of the chance to uh, to chat with you and to speak to this distinguished group. Um, I can remember speaking <laughs> to this group um, at the very beginning of my political career in the the early, late 1970s, um, and uh, have have uh, enjoyed my interaction with uh with everyone since then um and uh in my current role uh i've been spending a lot of time thinking and and working in 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 the field of development because although many people think of new york as you know fundamentally the the political center of the un's activities um the reality of our of our work and of our mission here um, is that we spend a great deal of our time dealing with um, social and economic issues, particularly in the time of COVID and in the time of climate change. And and that's really the the the, the theme of my of, of my of my presentation. Um, and, and it's when I got here in in the late August of last year, uh, I inherited uh, two interesting jobs from my predecessor, Marc-Andre Blanchard. The, the, the first one was chair of the Peace Building Commission, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, and the second is um, co-chair with the ambassador from Jamaica of um, a group called Friends for Financing Development, or everything in the UN has an acronym, as you know, FFD for short. Uh, and I took on that job just at the time when uh, we were coming to grips with uh, what I think is a critically important issue. Uh, and that is the 
the social and economic impact of COVID-19 uh, and its horrendous impact, particularly on the developing world, uh, and how we have to understand the, the risks that uh, COVID-19's impact uh, pose to, um, to global security. It's, it's obvious, I think, and it's become even clearer as time goes on, that the, the underlying issues prior to COVID-19 um, were serious enough. Uh, in terms of the um, glaring inequalities between richer countries and poorer countries, uh, the continuing challenges of uh, getting to a, a more equitable approaches to, to development, uh, the challenge of getting the wealthier countries to stay the course in terms of not only their uh, development assistance, but also, uh, you know, their their understanding of uh, how underdevelopment was uh, such a systematic problem in so many different parts of the world. And while we can point to major strides in economic improvement in uh, con big countries, major countries like, like India and, and, uh, and China, we also had to recognize that the fate of the least developed countries was, uh, was not improving. Um, in any significant way, and in some parts of the world was actually getting worse. And then COVID hit. So while many speakers will often say, well, COVID's a great leveler, right? We're all in the same boat, we're all together here, we're all equally impacted by COVID, it's brought us together as societies. I, I don't think that's true. I think that COVID has tended to isolate people uh, I think COVID has accentuated and revealed the inequalities which were already there. I think it's made them more serious, um, more deeply seated. Um, and it's had a, a, a social, a psychological, an economic, as well as a political, um, had, a, had all of those impacts. And, and those impacts are, are very, very serious indeed. Um, how how the how the uh, advanced economies have responded um, has been, I think, a reflection of of, of some of the re difficult realities of, of our of our time. The first one being that uh, populations in de democratic countries, indeed in every country, but particularly in democratic countries where governments have to be reelected re every three or four years or two. Um, it, it creates, uh, those populations create a level of demand for service, for a response from their government to a pandemic, to making sure that there is an access to the vaccine that is developed as quickly as possible. But once it's developed, to make sure that people uh, who are voting for this government can get access to the vaccine. So while we did create some global institutions to try and distribute vaccines, and Canada did contribute and has contributed and is continuing to contribute to those global um, institutions like COVAX and Gavi, the ones that are established in, uh, in, the, in, in Geneva, we need to understand and recognize the level and degree of resentment that has been created um, in developing countries because of the lack of access to vaccines and the, um, the, I would say the difficulty that, that they have experienced in getting the, the advanced economies to wake up to this impact and to understand um, how serious the situation is. And at the Friends of Financing Development, we were right in the middle of that discussion. Uh, our partner was Jamaica. We were with the Secretariat of the UN. So that put Canada in a position where we, we listened, we had to listen to the concerns. And not only listen to the issues around access to the vaccine, which is one particular set of issues that still exist very strongly in the world today, we also had to listen to the issue of the impact on the, vac on, on the e e economies of, of countries because of the lockdown, because of the, the, the uh, 
impact that it had had on their labor markets, on their ability to to work, their ability to export, their ability to uh, maintain supply lines, uh, the ability to receive uh, payments from overseas, from their remittance payments, from their uh, from their citizens who were gone to work in other countries, um, just a whole bunch of things that uh, had held things together in a number of countries just disappeared, evaporated. Uh, and I think we need to understand the impact as, as one um, representative from, um, from a, an island state said to me, he says, we're considered to be high income because of the impact of tourism and the impact of foreigners living in our, in, in our country. But we can go in effect from being a high income to a no income country in, in two weeks. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and, and I think we need to understand the, the, the enormous uh, disruption that COVID created, um, which in a sense added to um, a set of difficulties which um, were already present. There's a very interesting article today in the Financial Times, which, which I think is well worth reading if you can get a hold of it. Um, which talks about uh, how the the Belt and Road uh, efforts by China um, have created enormous uh, problems with respect to um, public debt, um, and and I think we we all need to appreciate as Canadians that as um, um, countries become more indebted, which many of them were doing long before COVID. Um, and the IMF and the World Bank said, you know, you've, you've come to our well too often. And other countries would say, no, we, we can't do anything for you. The Chinese and, and Russians, frankly, have all have been said, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come in and help. We'll be there. We'll respond. And so in that response, they've, they've created conditions of dependence, um, non-transparency of the loans, and, and, the, and the situation is is now uh, critically important as we look as to how are we going to restructure these debts? How are we going to deal with the question of the debt architecture? All of which is a long introduction to the issue of adaptation and resilience and climate change, because it's, it's on top of this structure that these other uh, discussions are taking place. We will be heading to COP26 um, with uh, an effort, again, Canada co-chairing with Germany this time, um, the work on climate finance. And in all of our discussions here at the UN with, with the folks who have been working on the, the, the adaptation side of the agenda for uh, developing countries, um, we, we have had to tell them very directly that before you, you, you get into the debate about, cli about climate change and finance, you need to understand the context in which this is taking place. A dramatic increase in the level of uh, what's called private debt, but is actually not always private debt. Sometimes it comes from state banks like, like China, for example. So you have substantial increases in indebtedness, which were already in place, which have been accelerated and aggravated by COVID, um, not leveled by COVID, but accelerated, magnified, aggravated, by COVID, and uh, a deep sense of resentment that so much of the focus on the debate around climate change has been on the question of mitigation. In other words, how do we get the big emitters to reduce their emissions? Whereas for a number of countries, climate change is not a 2050 issue. Climate change is a today issue. Uh, it's not about oh, what do we do uh, in 30 years if we haven't properly dealt with the emissions question. The question is, what do we do now to save people's lands, territory, jobs, work opportunities, economies and societies, because climate change has already had uh, such a dramatic uh, impact. Um, and to, to that impact, we had, we had other basics like biodiversity, decertification, what's happening with, with the, the issues of, of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of what's called the blue economy, the blue ecology, it's happening to the oceans. These things are all connected uh, and they're deeply connected by, uh, by climate change.
Canada has doubled its climate finance, um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We've also um, made it made it very clear that more of that will go to adaptation uh, and to in increasing resilience to uh, to climate change. Um, but we have to recognize, and everyone has to recognize that the processes that we've adopted and we've put forward have, have been slow. So we, 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 we're not moving as quickly as we need to. We're not engaging as much as we, as we must engage. Um, and uh, we keep um, pretending as if it's, it's simply going to get better on its own, which is, I think, globally an enormous mistake that we must, we must not wake. I think we'll see in, at COP26 in Glasgow how uh, successful we are or can be in dealing with these these three very much connected issues, the issues of of the of the impact uh, of of the double whammy of climate change and COVID nineteen on the global not only the global economy but the global ecology and and how these things are intimately connected um, and. It's good that the world is getting together. I think the debate will be um, will be difficult and challenging, um, and it will continue to be. I can only say that I think Canada's voice uh, is going to be quite clear in trying to find bridges between uh, the OECD countries and uh, and other countries when it comes to issues around um, adaptation and resilience. Um, but we still have a long way to go, and I know that many of you, with your your uh, lifelong commitment to uh, to global development, uh, to global equity, to global fairness. Uh, I, I know you'll be very much involved in those discussions and watching them very, very carefully. Uh, and I look forward to um, answering any any questions or comments that you may have. And deeply appreciate the uh, the chance to uh, to join with you today. Thank you for for letting me do this. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for that stimulating and uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, we have one question in the Q&A queue, and while we're waiting for others to log in, may I um, perhaps uh, start by posing a couple myself? Um, it's very interesting that you have raised the issue of debt of the developing countries as an underlying and very uh, disturbing uh, issue confronting not only developing countries, but the global community. This same point was raised by our first keynote speaker, Jayati Ghosh, when she spoke to us last Thursday. Um, does that mean that you or Canada would be in favor of uh, revisiting some of the debt relief measures that were undertaken uh, in the late 1990s and 2000s, the heavily indebted poor country initiative? for example, in the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, which uh, forgave a lot of the debt of the poorest countries, uh, except with the addition this time of China as also being uh, one of the biggest creditor countries uh, involved. And China has never been typically at the table with uh, other uh, creditor countries in the OECD. So how, how do you see that playing out uh, in, in the short term, in the years ahead? Well, the, the euphemism, uh, Roy, that we all use is talking about the debt architecture, um, which I think is sort of a fascinatingly kind of bromide phrase that doesn't really describe the uh, the nature of the challenge. Um, look, we you know we we've, we've got forty countries right now that are in in deep trouble. Um, uh, that's well documented. Um, many cases, countries don't like to broadcast how difficult their situation is. Um, one of the problems with the Chinese debt is that its terms are not uh, are not public. Uh, its conditions are not public. Um, and the Chinese have been have been pushing this fiction that their debt is commercial debt. It's not it's not public debt. Um, and and that is that is just nonsense. Uh, so the process of bringing the Chinese institutions into the discussion is is uh, is critically important and it's going to be very challenging um i don't think there's any doubt at all that in the next year 
a uh, year and a half, you know, however, however long people want to delay it for, there's going to have to be a substantial uh, restructuring of that of that debt. Um, that it, it, it is going to require um, a, a recognition on the part of the of the lenders that as we have as we have done in the past, as you mentioned, have been this is not the first restructuring and it won't be the last one. Um, but we get into these patterns where, um, you know, there's a bit, there was a bit of an illusion, I think, on the part of the of the Western countries and the and 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 the IMF and 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 and, and the World Bank that and the development banks that if they said no, that would mean the, that the borrower would, would would get the message and would go off and and try to try to deal with the problem. But that's not what happens. The borrowers then go off and say, well, if you're going to say no, uh, we'll go somewhere where we can get the money. And they found a place to get the money. And as often, and we know this from, from human behavior, uh, in other instances, you know, you, you borrow from your credit card to pay your mortgage. And when you start doing that, you're, you know, you're in deep trouble. And that's exactly what, what we're seeing uh, play out on the, on the global stage. The impact on human services and the impact on people and on the ability of those governments to, to respond to the needs of their people is extremely serious. And just to make things sound a little gloomier, there's a whole question of not only debt, but what is the, what is the price of that debt? How much are we paying in interest payments for the debt? And as we all know, interest payments, interest costs generally have been going, have been going down very substantially over the last 20 years, uh, even longer, 25 years. Um, uh, unfortunately, too late for my government, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, but I, I think everybody understands that the cost of debt is a critical issue. And, and one of the things I think is worrying a lot of thoughtful observers is to say, if interest rates start to rise and we then begin to see the costs of borrowing increasing on existing debt, let alone future borrowing, it's going to be very difficult. And, and that, I think, is, is the real risk of where we are today from a, from a global perspective. And I think there will be efforts by some countries to keep the UN out of this discussion and say, no, no, this is between borrowers and lenders. Uh, let us handle it over in this corner here. Don't worry about it. The fact is the borrowers won't let that happen. And frankly, if we were in that position, we wouldn't let it happen. Um, we, there is going to be a process where this will become an issue at the center of the debate in the, in the UN, both here in New York and in Geneva. Thank you for that expansive response. May I press, just press you on another question um, that uh, relates to um, what um, Jayati Ghosh, our first keynote speaker, uh, spoke to. That is um, using SDR's special drawing rights issued by the IMF, uh, recycling them, as it were, from those countries, including Canada, that don't really need the SDRs to the developing countries to give them relief and liquidity support at this crucial time. Do you have any thoughts or would the government have any uh, notions of, of using this? It was described by Jayati as low-hanging fruit. It's something that can easily be done at no cost. There are discussions going on right now as, as we, you know, literally as we speak um, at the IMF um, about the conditions under which SDRs could be swapped or reallocated. Um, I would just make a couple of points. One is it's important to get away from the notion that SDRs are just free money. Uh, they're loans. They increase liquidity, but they, they also um, are, uh, you know, come with a certain cost, not a, not a massive cost, but it, it's, a, it's a bit illusory to think that this is just free money that magically is given away and doesn't appear on anybody's books. That, that's, that's not the case. The second is to say that th there are discussions underway about under what conditions would, would uh, swapping take place. In other words, what would be the minimum, um, you know, kind of uh, requirements that one would make of, of uh, the people who are applying and I know this sounds like bankers talk, but actually there are some things around, you know, where's the money going? What's it being used for? 
um, where um, what's the impact going to be on resilience, for example? Um, is there uh, is there a green building back better, which is the, the lingo of the UN at the moment that I know that works for us, uh, that will work for you, too. So, yeah, it's being discussed. And it's I, I think it is low hanging in a way. Um, and the six hundred and fifty billion um uh, that is a big number and it's 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 um, sounds like it's huge but i think there are a lot of economists who say that's just the beginning of what's required that in fact the the uh, the, the the fiscal inequity between the richer countries and the poorer countries the ability of the richer countries to borrow um i think has been demonstrated in the last year and is another source of inequity and so it's it's something which creates a uh, a uh, serious debate. Great. Let's go to our audience now uh, who weighed in. There's quite a few questions in the, in the Q&A queue. Uh, Peter McKinnon asks, can you please comment on the role and influence of developing countries and NGOs in furthering the COP process regarding climate change within the UN climate program? I think it'll be very significant, uh, David. I think it's going to be a, a very important part of the of the conversation uh, leading up to COP and at COP. I think it would be fair to say that um, here at the UN, it is you know this is the one place here and in Geneva where we actually engage in these conversations all the time uh, with developing countries, and we we Canada's really try to develop a strong lines of communication. Um, but we're going to have to do even more. And building up to COP26, I, I met with Minister Wilkinson um, last earlier this week and talked about this this issue directly with him. And he's going off to Milan to the to the pre-COP um, meeting. And, and I think that's that's where I think it's important for us to engage with the uh, with the developing countries uh, and really start start to bring them into the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug Roche, who I'm sure you know well, uh, is, asks, UN Secretary General, in our common agenda, calls for a new social contract between governments, institutions, and civil society to raise support for the SDGs. And he wants a summit of the future to strengthen <laughs> to strengthen long-range planning. What is Canada's position on this? Well, uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, good to hear from you, uh, always. Um, I, I, I believe, and here I'm really giving my personal take, I, uh, which is always dangerous, but, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. I think the Common Agenda is, is, an, is an excellent document. I think it's a very thoughtful um, summary of uh, the challenges facing the UN system as a result of all the forces, that, some of which I've described, but all of which, because I limited my comments. And, and I think uh, particularly, I think that his notion, his concept of how do we, how do we make the SDGs more meaningful for member states, for local governments, how do we connect them up this has to be part of an ongoing dialogue in every country about the, the nature of the importance of creating a sustainable economies and sustainable societies and what that means. And I think connected to that is his idea that uh, the, 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 the main, both beneficiaries and, and uh, potential losers, if we fail to, in, to create these, this degree of sustainability, are going to be future generations. So in our thinking, and the Secretary General made reference to this, Canadians will be very aware of it, this notion of seven generation thinking, where we look to what is the impact of our decision going to be on, on seven generations going forward. I think this is, this is uh, you know, very, very, very important. And I, I, think, I think the common agenda should start more of a, of a global debate. I, I know that Minister Garneau referred to it in his conversation with the SG on, uh, on Monday. Uh, and uh, I think Canada will be a very active participant in those discussions. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Bruce Campbell, and it uh, has bearing upon the discussion that you dipped into regarding access of vaccines uh, in developing countries. And Bruce asks, 
What is Canada's position on the vaccine waiver for the TRIPS agreement within the World Trade Organization? Uh, I think our preferred option is to see a successful no negotiation uh, between uh, between producing countries and producing companies um, and um, developing countries and developing companies. Um, and there's been a lot of work done in Geneva, which has been happening under the radar, but it has been happening to try to get to uh, a negotiated solution, mainly because um, you can have a TRIPS waiver, but unless it comes along with a transfer of technology and expertise, you, you're not really uh, going to make as much progress as you think. So I, I, I think it's really important for us to, to appreciate the, the, you know, where the, the commercial um, reality, if you like, and the, the, the political desire. I, I strongly believe we have to increase vaccine capacity in, in, in a number of countries. I really believe we have to be fostering new partnerships. And I think governments, because we're paying such a, a large amount for the product, should be doing everything we can to encourage the, 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 the dialogue that's going to uh, create some, some important breakthroughs. Um, but I, I'm not one of those people who says, um, you know, you can ignore, on the one hand, you can ignore intellectual property and just say, just set it aside. Or on the other side, say that, well, intellectual property is, is, is so, so sacred that we can't even discuss how technology will be transferred and how expertise will be, will be transferred. And I think we have to say the transfer of technology and expertise and the ability to produce is in the public interest. And uh, I think that's, that's the kind of approach that I think Canada has been trying in, in a way to act as sort of a party that's, in the, that's willing to listen to all sides. I've had very good discussions with, with people, the ambassador from South Africa here, talking about the, the importance of getting to practical solutions. And I think actually that's something that, that, is, that is taking place. Okay, next question, with indulgence to John Foster, I think we'll skip over because it was uh, quite similar to the previous question by, by Bruce on uh, waivers. Um, so we'll go to the um, comment and question submitted by Manfred Bienefeld. Despite the article you cited in the FT today, serious studies have suggested that China's treatment of debt problems in the developing world compare favorably to the ways in which international uh, financial institutions and particularly private investors have dealt with the issue. Moreover, is the fact that the main Western countries have continued to impose severe economic sanctions of questionable validity, especially in the case of Cuba, on many countries in the midst of the COVID crisis. Um, some had hoped that Canada would remain a more neutral arbiter in these kinds of debates. Oh, we are. I mean, we, we. I mean, I don't think my comments about. Well, first of all, if you know something about uh, Chinese commercial and public debt, that tells that tells you that they've been much more lenient than others. Uh, that's not, I think, uh, not universally perceived to be the case. And part of our problem and part of the world's problem in dealing with with the Chinese debt is that it's deemed by them to be private. Uh, and it's also deemed by them to be uh, the conditions under which they have signed contracts and loans and, and others is, is not as transparent as the public debt that is established through the rules from through the IMF and the World Bank. The, the second point I would make is um, private private loans everywhere <laughs> suffer from the same problem. Um, but the most rapidly growing category of quote private debt is is the debt that that is associated with China. The, the but there's no question that private debt of all kinds comes with uh, with with real disadvantages for the countries that have that have agreed to do that. Um, you're quite right about uh, on the issue of sanctions. 
um, on Cuba. Canada doesn't doesn't agree with those sanctions. You sure the sure the uh, the questioner knows that. Um, and we have we have been as much of a um, I wouldn't say neutral because we do have our own values and views and 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 we do have. We, we do have experience in, in, in this field, so we're not exactly neutral or disinterested, but we've certainly been very, very engaged in trying to get the parties to a, to a better place when it comes to the, the issues of how the, how, how the debt is going to be restructured and how it needs to be, to be uh, restructured. We've been very um, strongly in favor of um, the, the proposal put forward by Kristalina uh, Georgieva at the uh, at the IMF on the need to create a resiliency trust, which would respond in particular to the needs of um, of the SIDS of the small island developing states and, and others. We've been arguing strongly for a vulnerability index to to uh, replace um, other ways in which countries' um, debt needs are being are being categorized. So the suggestion is somehow we're you know we're we're. No one is is no one believes that the the current situation is is perfect or in fact is even sustainable. My point is it, everybody has to be at the table, and there's been some difficulty in getting that to happen. Great, thank you. Um, the next uh, question by Gerald Smith Schmitz um, links these two issues uh, of debt relief and increasing finance for climate adaptation goals. Is there a possibility that those two things can be linked? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, will, I will elaborate. Don't be accused of elaborating too much. Um, yes, that's part of the, that has to be part of the discussion. The fact is, is that, uh, what, you know, the phrase is building back better. You can't build back better if you're imposing a new, a new set of loans on an existing loan structure that's unsustainable. So you need to restructure loans, figure out how to um, inject other uh, other forms of, of of capital and other other ways of. Uh, I mean, there's going to be an increase in grants, for example, out of the hundred billion. But the hundred billion is just the tip of the iceberg of what is required. Um, there are many, many trillions. Uh, of dollars of investments that are going to be required to get us to um, a better and more sustainable economy in the in the in the whole world, but in the developing world in particular. So, um, you know, part of the purpose of the hundred billion dollar uh, climate financing uh, opportunity is 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 supposed to be, as the phrase goes, catalytic, catalytic of other investments. Uh, catalytic of other approaches that are needed to be taken to uh, to get us to uh, to a better place. But can I just um, add a carry on from that uh, regarding Canada's own performance or contribution with respect to climate finance in general and adaptation finance in particular? Um, several studies, including lately an ODI uh, study in June pointed to the uh, fact that Canada was really in the basement in this respect, uh, spending way too little compared to other countries in the OECD. Do you want to comment on that? And is Canada actually going to emerge from that basement sometime? I think so. Um, well, I, I think that, you know, one of the one of the problems that we've had and I think that this new this new effort now at COP26, I think, is going to help us has helped us to focus. Is we need to we need to have a much greater appreciation of the context in which these programs are being announced. There's no point of an, in announcing a program that um, nobody's going to take up. It's sort of like a bank saying, you know, come and get your money, and you say, but the terms under which you're, you're, you know, you're lending this is it doesn't take my situation sufficiently into account, and I think that's that's where we need to have a much more comprehensive approach. I think that's Mr. Wilkinson made that clear in his announcement that there was going to be an increase in the amount for adaptation. There was going to be an increase in the amount uh, that would go to grants as opposed to loans, um, and, and then we're. You know that's Canada's position, and then we're part of a discussion 
uh, and that goes beyond beyond this to talk about well how is how is this going to fit into the restructuring of of uh, of debt uh, that needs that needs to happen. So I mean I I think you're right. I mean I think the 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 challenge that we face is not to announce programs, but to make sure that the programs actually lead to um, a very real take up in the in the in the uh, financing that's being made available. And we do have to be acutely aware of what other countries are doing and and how they're doing it in such a way that we can appreciate the the need to to move in more more effectively. Okay, we're almost running out of time. Our drop dead uh, closure is in three minutes. So let me go to Jeff Pass more quickly. UN has the net zero banking alliance, but because 50% of Canadian banks portfolios are reliant on fossil fuels, only one Canadian bank is a member, Van City. At the same time, Canada has the worst record of the G7 regarding greenhouse gas emission reductions vis a vis our Paris commitments. Why should anyone take an all hat, no cattle country like Canada serious, seriously at COP26? Uh, well, I think the simple fact is we, we have to do better. Um, I, I don't think there's any, there's any doubt about that at all. Uh, I can only say that um, those of us who are in positions of trying to um, encourage change uh, in Canada, are um, are continuing to do that, um, but I, I I do think that um, that the comment of of of, uh, of all hat no cattle I don't think is entirely merited. I think that you know when when you consider um, um, the nature of our of our natural resource economy, yes, there's a there's a there's a challenge. Um, and there's no question in my mind that the current government um, intends to make further and deeper changes. Um, I think some of the things that we've set out that we that we plan on doing, you know, with the private sector, are uh, are going to be critical. I think Mark Carney's um, intervention as an advisor to the uh, to the Secretary General is all about um, getting getting the private sector more lined up. Uh, to uh, to engage with the world of, of of climate change and with the creation of a of a greener economy, I think you've seen signs even this week where the Quebec CAS uh, uh, announced its its own plans to to move to move in a in a in a sustainable direction in terms of its of its lending. Um, yeah, it's been difficult. I mean, it's difficult for the Canadian institutions that are so closely tied to the real economy of Canada and different parts of Canada, and that economy has has involved the the, uh, the production of fossil fuels. I mean, that is that is that is a part of our economy. We can't pretend that it isn't. Um, so there there is going to be a process by which we we engage and are involved. I think internationally, for example, we've been very clear. Um, when it comes, for example, to, to going beyond coal and really trying to look at the at the uh, the nitty gritty, if you like, of of where the the uh, the development banks in different parts of the world are and how they're either going to lend or not going to lend, and I, I think that ground is changing very very quickly, uh, and that I think is has been very, very encouraging. Um, uh, and and, and uh, I think we need, we need to understand that there's, there's going to be a trans, the, the process we're in is a process of transition. Um, we're, not, we're not suddenly shutting things down. Um, we are going to have to engage in a, in a real discussion about how transitions will take place. That's going to be true for coal. It's going to be true for other, for other industries as well. But it's not going to happen overnight. I I, I think our our uh, our deep level of interest is is appreciated by the countries that I talk to. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador, for sharing your insights. We're going to have to leave it there because we've run out of time. Uh, apologies to our last two questioners, but uh, I think everyone has uh, greatly benefited from your candid and and very in depth response to the issues and uh, engagement and conversation on, on these issues. 
but also, uh, I think, given our conference this week, we're uh, very pleased that um, the uh, issue of adaptation is now being given the prominence and the attention and the resources and the policy action that it has long uh, been deprived of. And, and hopefully um, our conference this week will make a, an additional contribution to pushing adaptation uh, action and policy even more in that direction. So thank you again, uh, Bob. Uh, thank you. Thank you to our question for your questions. And uh, please tune in to our next event, which is in just 10 minutes or so on communities and adaptation. If you want me to answer the two other questions, and I hate leaving, I used to always hate when I was in politics, uh, leaving people without a chance to speak. So I can take two short questions if it's helpful to you or unless you want to close it up. Okay. Will Canada do more to raise, to raise awareness domestically about the importance of the transformative transformation of, for Canada's adaptation policy? I hope so. Uh, they should, and I, I mean, I certainly, uh, certainly, I will be doing it from my point of view. I mean, my one of the things about my job is is to try to communicate a lot with Canadians about what we're doing globally and why these things are all connected. It's a mistake to think that what happens domestically doesn't impact us globally. It's a mistake to think that what happens globally doesn't impact us at all. These things are all connected. Okay, and the last from Sophia Murphy, Canada has a leadership role in the upcoming LDC, I take that to be the least developed countries conference in January. How does Canada see that responsibility and opportunity given the importance for LDCs of the joint and interactive effects of climate change, ODA, debt, trade, and investment rules and migration on the well-being of those people? I appreciate the question. I, I, I am the co-facilitator with with the ambassador from Bangladesh, uh, uh, Ravad Fatima, to, 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 to lead this discussion with the least developed countries. And it's, it's, uh, it's a great honor. I was asked to do it by the Secretary General after the work we did on financing for development. So it's a real continuation of that work. And it's it's uh, it takes us into the territory that we really discussed in depth over the last year about uh, about how to change global institutions in response to uh, to COVID-19. This is talking about the next decade of development and all of the issues that you have described um, where Canada will be front and center. And, and we will be uh, very directly engaged with um, with the UN system and with the rest of the world as we look at. How do we get to a how do we get to a clearer and stronger program in dealing with this particular period in time? Whereas I said, it, you know, COVID nineteen, climate change, the digital divide, the debt issues. I mean, all these things come together when you look at uh, the situation of the least developed countries. So yeah, we will be very directly involved. Great. Well, thanks again, and thanks for your engagement with the developing countries and development more generally to uh, the UN family. I think that's extremely important, and it leaves me with the thought that we need to engage with you another year down the road to see how we've actually performed. Sure. I'm happy to do that. Um, I really enjoy, as I said, I have a long association with the uh, with this group, and I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to, uh, to be able to uh, join with you today. Thank you so much for, for uh, coming to see me. Thank you again and good luck. Thanks.